many young Americans in the 1830s, the barely explored country that seemed to stretch endlessly west was an irresistible draw. So it was in 1835 for William Augustus Tanner, who arrived in Illinois at the age of 20, already trained as a surveyor and hoping to become a farmer. Within five years, he had claimed land, begun to farm, built a house, brought his parents and siblings to Illinois, and married a woman from back home in upstate New York, Anna Plum Makepeace. William and Anna farmed in the area west of Aurora, near present-day Orchard Road and Oak Street, and began to raise a large family. Things went so well that in 20 years they moved into town and acquired a hardware business. In 1857, they built this fine 16-room house and moved in right before Christmas with their nine living children, who ranged in age from three to 16. Over the years, most of the children married and began their own families, although Henry and Imogene remained single and lived in the house until their deaths in 1934. In 1936, the twins, Mary Tanner Hopkins and Martha Tanner Thornton, donated the house to the Aurora Historical Society, which today opens it to the public as a museum showcasing life in the late Victorian era, 1875 to 1900. We'd like to take you on a short tour of the house, and to do that, we will start where every guest would have been received the elegant, formal parlor, just inside the front door. In the Victorian era, the parlor would not have been used for everyday family living, but it would have been the focus of holidays and special occasions, and a place for entertaining guests. Five Tanner daughters were married in this room and three funerals were held here. Since the general idea was to display the homeowner's wealth and good taste, this was the Tanner's fanciest room. The room has wonderful features, like elaborate plasterwork escutcheons and cornices painted in colors that may seem outrageous today, but because there are drips of paint under the wallpaper and carpeting, we know for certain what the Tanners liked and used. When building the house, Mr. Tanner, a practical and forward-looking man, made sure to have gas pipes installed throughout, so that 11 years later in 1868, when Aurora first obtained gas service, he only needed to install gasoliers and sconces to give his family the brightest new source of light. The carpeting is a reproduction of the Tanner's carpet made for us in England because the type of loom needed for so many colors is no longer available in the U.S. The fireplace was never a working one, possibly because as a hardware merchant, Mr. Tanner had access to the latest wood burning and coal burning stoves. But the surround of Italian marble added a note of refinement. The decorations above were hand painted the mantel clock was a 36th wedding anniversary gift 
from the children. Across the entrance hall is the family sitting room, just half the size of the parlor, but a place where family could relax with activities like letter writing, reading, sewing, and small amusements. Like the parlor, it has pocket shutters and a hanging light fixture, although this one has been electrified. We use this room to welcome visitors at the start of our in-person tours. A door connects the family sitting room with the library. This is Mr. Tanner's desk. A massive bookcase holds not just books, but also taxidermy birds, a popular Victorian decorative element. The heating stove is an example of the stoves that would have been in every downstairs room of the house. Like many Americans of the time, the Tanners were great admirers of Abraham Lincoln. Pictures and sculptures like this were very popular and could be found in many a home in America. The library has a second door, this one leading out into the hallway. This door to the dining room marks the halfway point of the house. We have shown you the front half of the house, the rooms with 12-foot ceilings, and floor-to-ceiling windows. When we step through this door, it is almost like entering another house. Now, we may assume we are in the more private part of the Tanner's home. The ceilings are lower and simpler, and the windows are slightly smaller. Given the modest size and decor of the dining room, we might guess that the Tanners did not do much formal entertaining at meals, but instead gathered the family here. It would have been a tight squeeze with nine children at the table. One family memoir we have in our archives describes two tables set up in this room for holiday dinners. In this room, as in the parlor, the fireplace was strictly for show, and this one is not even marble, but wood painted to fool the eye. As we have already mentioned, the house was at first heated entirely by stoves, and there would have been a stove in here someplace. Towards the end of the century, the Tanners installed hot water heat, which was delivered by small radiators. An unusual aspect is the door, which is now hidden by a large china cabinet added by the Historical Society. When the house was built, that door led to a small porch, which has since been removed. The dining room has easy access to both the kitchen and the pantry, both of which would have been advantages to a family accustomed to serving themselves at meals. The kitchen is the heart of every home, and it was no different in the Victorian era or for the Tanner family. The sturdy cast iron cook stove is the kind that the Tanners would have had. It is a wood-burning stove and was located in the middle of the room. The stove is a model of efficiency because not only could you use your pots and pans to boil or fry on top of the iron plates which were heated by fire directly below, but there was an oven and a reservoir for keeping water warm. Heavy metal pressing irons could be heated on the stove top on laundry day. Although it probably would never have been located next to the stove, there is an ice box. Chunks of ice cut from the Fox River in the winter and stored in ice houses were delivered by horse and wagon year-round. 
The pantry adjoins the kitchen and also opens into the dining room. Built-in cabinets provided storage. The sink is copper lined and has a drainage pipe. Most likely water was fetched in pails from the well pump just outside the kitchen door. Before we go upstairs to see the four bedrooms there, let's take a look at the bedroom just off the dining room. According to family accounts, this is where Mr. and Mrs. Tanner slept in their later years. You will understand why this would have been more comfortable for them when you see the 22 steep steps up to the second floor. It is a cheerful and sunny room with French doors. Once municipal water and sewer service arrived in the neighborhood by the early 1890s, a space adjoining the bedroom became one of Aurora's first indoor bathrooms, rendering obsolete the privy which was located near the barn. But now, we are ready to go upstairs. With the 12-foot ceilings on the first floor, it is no surprise that the stairway up is steep. The substantial railing is mentioned in a family memoir as being a favorite place for grandchildren to slide down until their giggles attracted the attention of disapproving adults. Up here are the four bedrooms which would have been shared by the 11 members of the family living there in 1857. Victorian lifestyle did not include separate rooms or even separate beds for each member of the family. We don't have any records of which of the children slept in this first bedroom, although there may be a clue in the window. In delicate, old-fashioned script, someone has scratched the names Florence and Amy, the year 1866, and the unfinished sentence, I love. The girls were the fourth and fifth of the Tanner children and would have been 20 and 21 years old at that time. Both were married within a few years. Just outside this room is a door to what is commonly called the servant's quarters. That area is not on the tour and is used for storage today. It was clearly the least prestigious part of the house and was connected to the kitchen below by a narrow set of stairs. It's interesting that from the outside, you would not know how dramatically different the servant's quarters are from the family living space. Whoever was responsible for the design of the house maintained a wonderful harmony overall. Since we have a pretty strong suspicion that at least two of the oldest daughters shared the northwest bedroom, we suppose the other bedrooms went to their three younger sisters and their three brothers. We do know that the northeast bedroom was used by their parents, this room had lovely views towards the river and the neighborhood to the north. Also on this floor is the upstairs sitting room, a small room where the family could have gathered to read, play games or musical instruments, write letters, pursue hobbies, or just talk. The music box, although fragile and temperamental now, has a beautiful sound. from the family that during the Civil War, Mrs. Tanner would sometimes sit at the window in the evening, praying. Before trees and houses obscured the view, it would have been possible for her to see the Fox River flowing southward across a war-torn nation. One final thing to talk about is the cupola. 
the octagon-shaped structure on the roof, which is reached by a very narrow winding stairway and is not open to the public. It is not just a pretty finishing touch on the roof, although it is pretty. It also performed an important function. In Victorian times, the house could be cooled off in the summer by opening the four small windows up there as well as the house windows. Being lighter, hot air would rise up through the center of the house and escape through the cupola while creating a zone of low pressure inside that pulled in fresh air down below. The opening was covered in the winter to conserve heat. So now you have seen the highlights of the Tanner House Museum, one of the finest gems of Aurora, Illinois. We hope you have enjoyed this virtual tour and hope that you will come in person sometime soon. We have guided tours and seasonal programs and we would always be glad to see you. Thank <laughs> you.